<laughs> but sticking around for another 40 for just a little FaceTime, which in the business we call a Kalashaw, eliminated, but you think you deserve a FaceTime, right? Right? Yo, the Dano Kalashaw exactly we call it. Stole it. Here's exactly my Joe West. We call it. Let's I'll get her on. <laughs> T-Rex. Ooh, who's here for a little T-Rex challenge, are you? You ever seen him in concert? Oh, you better, you bet. NBA news of the moment, Kevin Durant option declined. Officially, an unrestricted, although very restricted, Achilles-wise, free agent. Frank Isola, start with you. Does this surprise you, and what does it mean now? No, it doesn't surprise me. You have to love the fact that it's considered a formality that he's going to turn down $31 million knowing that he can't play next season. But it's a smart thing to do. He's going to get either a four-year deal from fill in the blank, whether it's Brooklyn, maybe it's New York, and a five-year deal if he stays with the Golden State Warriors. It was a smart Sarah play. Spain? Yeah, this isn't surprising at all. There was really no good reason for him to take this. I think when he first got hurt, people thought, oh, maybe do this and then make his decision. Not a chance. Not when there are teams out there willing to give you the max. Same amount of money you would have had before the injury and be making all that money while you're rehabbing. Yep. The sign and trade possibility, is that done or is that still in play, Tim Kalashaw? You know, I, I, I think that's unlikely. I mean, I think the only thing he could have done, you could have seen him stalling the decision, you know, taking the one-year option and getting the big money next summer. But there's not going to be as many teams uh, having big money available next time around. And I don't think anybody's even bothered by the fact that he's not going to play for maybe up to a year. They're still going to come after him. George Sedano. I disagree. I think the sign and trade is still in play, Reality, because if he wants the maximum amount of money yeah, in the maximum the amount of years, he can still pull that off. And there have been reports that says the Warriors are willing to do that because they could get asset backs, assets back in that particular situation. But here's the deal, man. Like He's in a situation where he had to opt out. He's going to make $31 million if he opts in. He can make a starting salary of 41 if he opts out, regardless of who he signs with. Let's go back around the horn here. How do you think this affects the Warriors' approach this summer, George? Uh, I think that they kind of felt all along here, at least for the last several months, that Kevin Durant was probably leaving. So their goal is to make sure that their big three is still intact and find a way to accumulate assets to kind of help those guys moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. And I think they almost have to have two approaches. One is the longer term approach of what they're going to have for a few years, but also yeah. one for this coming season. Clay Thompson obviously is going to miss a chunk of it. Whether Kevin Durant stays or not, he's going to miss almost all of it. They've got to put kind of a different team together for this year while still extending clay and being mm -hmm. good beyond. Sarah Spain. I don't think this move particularly changes it. I think the way we saw things go down with Kevin Durant and Draymond and everything this season, it felt like it was either we're fixing this and he's on with us for the long haul or he's gone. Not one more year of trying to figure out whether he wants to stick around or and go. And Frank, any last thoughts after the horn? Well, Clay Thompson, they've always wanted to bring back. Durant's the interesting one because if he doesn't resign with them, yeah, he's not playing next season. You don't, want to, you don't know what he's going to be like the following year. So I think for the Golden State Warriors, I don't, they want him back. I don't think they'll be heartbroken if he leaves, leaves because we know he's not playing next season. Other NBA news of the day, and this is interesting. The league's 75th anniversary coming up in 2021-22. NBA exploring a midseason cup, which we kind of already knew, right? A postseason play-in tournament, wowsy, wow, 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 and reducing the 82-game season. This is for Kevin Arnovitz. George, what do you think the NBA will find when it goes exploring? I love this idea. I thought that the lockout shortened season of 66 games was maybe the most interesting season we've had in a really long time. And players loved it. What they didn't love was the fact that it was compacted in 123 nights. Now, if you spread that thing over, you know, a regular season, I think you have a better chance. And look, they're going to have to reduce the games if they're going to add these tournaments. I'm not sold on the midseason tournament, but the post getting into the postseason, a tournament for that makes a ton what of sense. What do you see as that, George? That's, that's a plane for the eight seed, playing for the seven and eight seed i think that maybe the seven and eight seed is a possibility and how about home court advantage why not that tim cal let's show where are you on this you know you think as a senior member of this panel i'm just going to get off my lawn on the whole thing but i'm really not i am i am on board uh, certainly with the shorter season and 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 george is right about uh the what we learned nba nhl lockouts shorter seasons mm -hmm. are better okay. and what owners and, and and teams need to learn is 
you know, you're, they look at sacrificing these games, how much revenue is that? But if you have a better product and you suddenly have better ratings and you're suddenly selling them for higher ad rates, you're not going to lose as much money losing those games as you think. I don't like the cup thing in the middle of the year at all. I don't think you can, can contrive something just because it works in soccer to, to work in the NBA. And the play-in, I think, 7-8 and eight versus 9-10, and 10, one game, big nights. Let's that do it. Speed? Yeah, I agree. The midseason tournament has absolutely zero interest for me, and I think the players would feel the same way. You can't magically devise some sort of meaning to something that's never existed, particularly when their eye is still on the ultimate prize of the postseason. The postseason play-in tournament is interesting to me. I do think that sort of wild card aspect of making it matter might diminish the desire to tank, although the same desire might be there if you think you're going to be the eight seed and get bounced right away. The, the lesser games is something we all kind of talk about for a number of sports, but the money gets in the way. They just signed a nine-year, $24 billion television deal in 2014 that still has several years right. remaining. The fact that they want to do this is going to be a bear when it comes to the logistics of convincing all of their partners that fewer games will end up being a benefit. Well, let's start there with our resident bear, Frank Isola. Frank, the idea mm -hmm. that money always gets in the way when we say shorter seasons, but this is the league exploring that. Well, I think they're listening to the players. That's something Adam Silver's always done. What I don't understand is they don't want to play 82, so then you're going to have a midseason tournament. That's a complete waste of time. Look at Kawhi Leonard, 60 games this season. He managed his way through the regular season. LeBron James, 55. You know when Kevin Durant comes back, whenever that is, he's never going to play in 75 games again. The NFL hit on something with every game is an event. I don't know if the NBA can get there, but if you did shorten the season, it would make the games bigger. And here's an idea. The best players will play in all the games. George, That's, that would and be then good Sarah. Too. Well, look, a midseason tournament will probably be single elimination. So even though I don't love it, that would mean players will still get their opportunity to rest. you got to make sure all the games get played out. So I don't think that affects the rest of them sitting out games. Sarah. Yeah, and Frank just said the best part about a shorter season is all the players would play, all the stars would play. Would they? Yes. Or would they just have load management to have even fewer games than the now fewer <laughs> games that they've been allotted so that they'll still be fresher than everyone who plays all of them? We don't know. What happened? That's, I like the way you think, Sarah. We'll move on. Kemba Walker, Celtics and Mavs leading the way in pursuit. This is a Mark Stein report. Tim, I know you got some skin in the game here with Dallas. Which team would be better fit for Kemba? You know, I think you would look at it and say the Celtics would be the more natural fit. A guy who grows up on the East Coast, goes to UConn, probably sees the Celtics in the Garden as a special place and a more natural point guard fit. But being paired with Luka Doncic, point forward, whatever you want to call him. They both want the ball a lot, but they can both shoot uh, without having the ball. Play those two with Porzingis. I think if he looks at the, at the long term and the ages of, of Doncic and Porzingis and the possibilities here, he's got to consider Dallas. Yeah, I think it's the Mavs. They lost Dennis Smith Jr. to the Knicks in that deal. There's a great space for him, and I think he elevates both Porzingis and Doncic. And then I think when you look at the Celtics, they're kind of in a transitional period. Of the players that they have under guaranteed contracts, seven of nine of them are under 25. You don't need to insert that max player now and try to push the button on winning. I think that time has sort of passed with the idea that Kyrie and Horford and likely other veteran players are leaving. Now's the time for the Celtics to embrace the rebuild and be younger, and maybe I think the Mavs to hit the button now. Frank Isola? I think he'd be great on a team like the Lakers, certainly Dallas, but I think Boston is a great fit for him. Also, remember, a couple of years ago, Isaiah Thomas was in the running for MVP, so not only would Kemba Walker be getting his money, he'd be surrounded by young talent and have a chance to be really be featured on a big-time franchise and be in that MVP debate, uh, debate. Plus, I believe right, you know, they'd be a top-four seed in the Eastern Conference, a chance to go to the finals with Kemba Walker as their point. Mm -hmm. So you don't believe they're the favorites, but you believe it makes sense. George Sedano, I saw your eyes light up when, when Frank invoked the idea of the Lakers. You can go there if you want, or Celtics and Mavs. <laughs> Actually, I, he, when he invoked Isaiah Thomas's name, that's exactly where I was going to go. If you look at Brad Stevens and what he did for Isaiah Thomas's yep. career, he has a very similar skill set to Kemba Walker, a ball-dominant player who can get to the rim at ease and also shoot Undecide. deep threes. That's exactly what the Celtics had. In theory, that's what they wanted with Kyrie. The problem was Kyrie wasn't able to give up the rock when necessary, nor was he a good enough leader. He wasn't as good a leader as Isaiah. Kemba's a guy, even though he's played on some tough teams that, that haven't made the playoffs that often, he is at least a guy that people view as a leader. And a max guy, right? I mean, you guys are all in favor of max money. Yeah. He has said I would take less in, Max, in this which market, is an interesting yeah. thing to say. Your agent, when you say, oh, no, what are you saying, man? But, uh, okay. Sedano, 11. Callis Shaw's got a number two, 12. Spain, 13. Frank Isola, 
10, Frank is our resident bear, I said. Is that right? <laughs> or, or is Bill Plasky the resident okay. bear? Stick around! Bull, bear. Can River Deck at Pier 17. The two greatest words in the collegiate language. Two for one, well drinks. Out. No, game three. An entire <laughs> season <laughs> down to one game. Wolverines and Commodores. Tonight in Omaha, last night, Kumar Rocker again saving Vanderbilt's season. He's 4-0 in the tournament, .96 ERA, 44 strikeouts and 5 walks. He could be in the minors right now, drafted in first round pick. Four, six, eight million in the bank right now. Nope. He's got the College World Series down to one game. George, what are you buying? What are you selling? I'm buying all of it. First of all, I'm buying that he listened to mom. Mom told him to go to school and play yeah, at Vandy. Yeah. I'm also buying the fact that uh, it's on a big stage, Reality, He'd be on a bus somewhere in some small town we've never heard of. He's doing it in front of a national TV audience. And I'm buying the fact that the last eight teams that have pushed to a game three have won it. So he's put his team in a great Now team. that's news I can use. Good information. It sounds like you've got Vanderbilt tonight. Kalish, how about you? I'm buying that a year from now we'll have an around the horn topic should Kumar Rockers sit out his junior year and just get ready for the draft <laughs> because uh, that's what we do with players who are great as freshmen and sophomores. I'm also buying, I hate to say this Michigan, that I think he just won the World Series for Vanderbilt. He, he gave the, the team a little relief. The bats got going last mm -hmm. night. I think they're the favorites that's now. That's two for Vanderbilt. Spain, how about you? I'm buying that he's clutch because the last time Vandy was facing elimination, he threw a no-hitter. So when you can get that kind of clutch performance from a freshman, that should make the teams looking to draft him in the future very happy. I'm also buying what George said. I love now as we continue to force athletes to take the money as soon as it's available, these moments where they embrace college and the experience of competing with their teammates and not being on a bus somewhere in the middle of nowhere commanding the stage here. I love watching. That word you use to describe coming up big in a big game, hmm. Potentially a word that is now on the band list, Sarah Spain. Wow. Nice. Frank Isola, how about you? So many words. Well, you know, going to college worked out pretty well for Zion Williamson. Uh, I think Kumar Rocker, first of all, he's got a great name. I love the number. My big question will be, can you bring him in at some point tonight, maybe to pe uh, pitch the last inning? Michigan has been a great story. I got uh, Coach Harbaugh at the game with his glove on. I got Michigan. 104 back. pitches last night. Now the team that drafts him going forward, like, oh, they pitched him back-to-back -back games. Did you guys see? <laughs> I, I don't know this man's name. It was a pitcher for Michigan 50 years ago <laughs> threw 300-plus pitches in a doubleheader, and they had him in the stands. It was an incredible cut yes. line. We'll move on. Joe West versus Gabe Kapler. This started because, well, after a couple Philly bombs, a pitch from the Mets' Wilmer Font near the headspace of Philly Scott Kingery. West gave a warning to both teams. Gabe Kapler didn't like the warning for both teams. This went on for 40 seconds, but Kapler did all of the talking after the ejection because he was ejected in three seconds, Tim. Who you got? Did Joe West get this right? <laughs> I don't think so. I've never understood the rule that you throw at a guy's head and the umpire is likely to warn both teams. Uh, why not just be the first team to throw in somebody's head? There's no penalty for it. But if you're going to have that rule, you have to let the opposing manager at least have a little bit of his say. And that's what Kapler wanted to say. What did we do wrong? How did we deserve that? Yeah, technically the rule allows for him to be ejected if he comes out of the dugout and tries to argue a warning. You're not allowed to argue a warning. But you shouldn't have gotten a warning in the first place because your team didn't do anything except stand in the box and get thrown at. So it's stupid, and when the rule is that stupid, he should be allowed to argue it. Of course it's a silly rule, but it's the rule. And he said, don't come out, don't come out. He came out of the dugout. I'm just glad there was a controversy and Mickey Calloway wasn't involved, even though he was at the game. Not bad. Sit down. The rule follower, Frank Isola, doesn't like celebrations and make sure that you follow the rule to the T. That's how it works with him. Uh, of course, this is silly. He went out there in a very calm fashion just to kind of explain himself. And Joe West did what a lot of umpires, a lot of officials in sports do. They act like we all came to see them. It's silly. Right. And then he did the T-Rex ejection there. It was very close to the, close to the body, you know. Bang a gong, you're done in three seconds. <laughs> that was for you older guys. We'll move on. Buy or sell three. But I think the young man is our future, and let's protect the future instead of throwing it out there right now and saying, okay, go get him. It's just a formula for disaster for the team, for Jay, for the fans, everybody else. 
Joe Theismann knows a little bit about quarterbacking Washington, and he called it a formula for disaster. Buy or sell Dwayne Haskins starting week one. Formula for disaster, Sarah. Listen, if he blows them all away and he appears to be the fastest and most adept quarterback at, at picking up all the plays and understanding all of his teammates, I guess you can start him. But there's not a lot of hope in D.C. right now, and I don't think putting him out there on a team that isn't going to contend is going to help him. Let him sit behind and learn a little bit before you force him I out saw there. That. Yeah, Case Keenum's going to start. And I think what Joe Theismann was saying, you know, Dwayne Haskins played 13 college games. Let him learn. It worked for Patrick Mahomes. It worked a long time ago for Aaron Rodgers. Let him sit. His time will coach down. I'm selling reality. This reminds me of when Pete Carroll said a very similar thing about Mark Sanchez. Mark Sanchez only played 17 games. Pete said he should have come back. Even Urban Meyer, who says that Haskins is the most accurate passer he's ever had, says inexperience is kind of the one area that he wonders if he's going to be able to play in the NFL that quickly. So that's one thing I'm selling. I'm selling Haskins in this situation. You're selling Haskins in this situation. Did you just compare him to Mark Sanchez? Well, I'm saying as far as the LA experience guy. is concerned, okay. yeah. Okay, I mean, yeah, college. experience concerned, but you just put that out there. Dwayne Haskins equals Mark Sanchez, people in Washington right now. No, that's not true. <laughs> How about you, Kalisha? <laughs> I'm selling out of here. that it's a recipe for disaster. I mean, Washington, Washington's going to have a good defense. Uh, Adrian Peterson and Darius Geis are going to run the ball now. Do they have enough receivers for any of those quarterbacks? Probably not, but I don't know that... It's a recipe for disaster, and Haskins, yeah, he hadn't played much. He threw 50 touchdown passes at Ohio State. Mm -hmm. He looks like he might sort of be ready. Okay. Ooh, George Dana, what would you describe that fall from grace there? Maybe a, a certain type of fumble. What type of fumble would, would come to mind here for you? <laughs> uh, but, like Ernest fumble. Biner? Maybe? No, the butt fumble. That's <laughs> it. I saw that. Fumble. Oh, Biner, please. To Dallas show, Sarah Spade. I don't think either one of you thought you were going to be in showdown. Here you are. I never do. Always do, yeah. actually. Two and two Always. on the other side. <laughs> to Dallas show, Sarah Spade. Welcome to showdown. Well, Jimmy Butler and the Rockets. Can you see that happening? Would it be wise for the Sixers to trade him? I don't think it makes any sense for the Rockets. It sounds good at first, and then you say, well, you got to lose Eric Gordon and Capella, or maybe P.J. Tucker, and you need certain kind of guys to play with Harden. Guys who can stand around and be patient and shoot threes. That's not Butler. Yeah, there's the basketball aspect. Well, first of all, you need all the pieces involved to be interested. Jimmy has to care enough to ask the Sixers to do it. Sixers have to allow it. Rockets have to want him. And then Chris Paul has to be okay with another dude coming in and taking away his shots and his balls. I don't know if that's going to work out. Can you imagine the mortal combat of Harden, Paul, and Butler on the court at the same time? I'd love to see that. You guys are splitting the point. We'll move on. Latest on Giancarlo Stanton, sore and stiff, Aaron Boone says. Not in today's lineup. Yankees still mashing home runs. Yet another, and another, today, 29 straight games, Major League record. Sarah, what do all the long balls mean? Well, uh, the research is telling us the ball is, in fact, different. But beyond that, the home runs uh, just seem to be the way the game is going now. Either get on board or get left behind, I guess. The amazing thing is they've done it without a lot of yes, indeedy, without a lot of all rise, <laughs> without a lot of, I won't even try a John Serling Stanton call. They've had key guys hurt much of the year, and they're still hitting bombs night after night. A sterling answer from Tim. And I thank you, Susan. That's baseball. Showdown three, Zion in the torch of New Orleans. Wow, passing the torch. Am I ready to take that on? City of New Orleans. Tim, should Breeze be passing torches? Should Zion be accepting torches? What's a torch? You know, it, it's a very odd thing, and, and let's back off a little bit on the pressure on this kid. Let him play. Let him turn 20. Let him, you know, get his feet wet in the NBA before we give him torches. Yeah, this is a classic premature torch passing. They were one bad call away from making it to the Super Bowl last year. If I'm a Saints fan, I'm like, whoa, 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 why are we passing torches already? Hang on to your torch. So you're saying it's a premature is what you're saying. I like the way you think, Sarah. I'm Spain. saying that. Got some time. Let's get for one game deciding showdown. Manny Machado, big cheers in his return to Baltimore, Sarah. Should there have been booze? Should there have been cheers? Well, how do you read how Baltimore should have felt about Manny? Absolutely cheers. He was traded away. He didn't decide to leave. And since he's gone, they're back to what you'd expect them to be. So you might as well cheer the guy that was giving you something to cheer for when he was there. Yeah, not only was he traded and then, you know, he had many pursuers in 
free agency, none of them named Baltimore. He also reminds Orioles fans of when they didn't lose 115 games a year. Of course they're going to cheer for that. Sarah Spain, 30 seconds of FaceTime. Uh, today's President Donald Trump criticized Megan Rapino for saying she wouldn't go to the White House and said she should be waiting till they win to make those kind of decisions. Well, she did say this a long time before the tournament started when asked specifically if she would go. And I'm interested to see how being criticized by the president and all the hubbub around this before their big game against France might affect her. We know she was negatively affected by threats and criticism when she previously spoke out about sincere issues. So I don't know what this means for the team. I also know that the most American thing is fighting for freedoms given to all that are only afforded to some right now, so we should all be proud of that. For this story to come out now, because those comments were made six months ago, that's intriguing as yeah. well. Also before the biggest game of the tournament today. A lot going on with this national game. We're on a 23 and a half hour break. Bob Lee, thank you!